Hello EFD squad and welcome back to Continental Club where we look at the hottest topics in European football as selected by you. Joining me is Pat in a deep blue. Hi. Really matches your soul. Dark. And DJ Alab on the end over there. Best glow up 2K18. <laughs> Anyhow, let's dive into our first question which comes from Jad Haydar. A bit of a lack of preparation this week, mm -hmm. right? We've had the podcast. That took up quite a lot of time. We had a Halloween party on Wednesday, which you probably all know about now because of Instagram. And subsequently, you will see how bad our performance was on Sunday Vibes as a result. This is the aftermath, all right? We're trying to pick up the pieces now, okay? Starting with Jad Haidar. Who's a player who you think would have been more effective had he played in a different position? So he's put Marcelo as a number 10 springs to mind. I think that's mm -hmm. where we all think Marcelo will probably finish his career, number 10 in Serie A in... Brazil, killing it for like, I don't know, Palmeiras or uh, just someone like Zero Better. Um, guys, have you got any strong contenders for this question? Because we had a brief chat beforehand. It's quite difficult. I would love to see Marcos Alonso play up front. Marcos Alonso. His, his defence ability is basically Yeah, he's terrible. So he's stick him up bad front. Defense. Analysis. No, but stick him up front because his finishing is arguably one of the best at Chelsea. Yeah, but surely he scores goals because strikers are the ones taking defenders away and so he's like the third, fourth man in the box. If he's the only man in the box, is he going to be as good? I'll be honest, I don't really see him actually playing up from Chelsea. But in all seriousness, <laughs> I doubt it's going to happen. But I hate I, him. I know you do. And I, I, I don't understand think he's good why. at all. I, I still hope Emerson's going to take over, but I don't really see that. Yeah, Emerson's or the Bailey, more, bring Bailey to Chelsea. I'll take Emerson's the more well-rounded player, player, isn't it? I think... He's taking around 1.8 shots per game at the minute, isn't he, Marcos Alonso? Which is probably the same as Romelu Lukaku. I think he's eighth best in the Chelsea squad at the minute, just behind Willian. That was courtesy of Patrick Van Strand's <laughs> script that I VO'd this morning. So <laughs> go and watch that turn if you haven't already on Football Daily. Uh, PVS, you got any outstanding candidates? Well, actually, at Chelsea, I mean, as Piliqueta, like, was a right back, a oh, centre back, yeah. played on the right wing, and has, has been absolutely incredible everywhere he's yeah. played. I mean, I can think of examples of people who've done this well, but I find it harder to think of people. I'd like to see in a different position. Like, I think there are quite a few wingers in the old days who would now probably be more like wing backs. Benefit from a 3 4 3 sort of thing. Yeah, well, well, not even that. I mean, like, if they paid for a really elite club, like Danny Alves would have just been a winger around the year 2000 mm. and was instead the one of the best right backs in the world for about 10 years. And similarly, you could see, I don't know. Maybe maybe even Beckham or Figo or someone doing a job at right back. Beckham I think that would have been really right fun. Back. That would have been, that'd have been great. Well, he's, he hasn't got the pace really to play on the wing in the modern game. Um, and actually the out and out winger, the uninverted winger, is quite a throwback. Yes. The people I think of who've done this well, James Milner, incredible mm -hmm. at left back a couple of seasons ago. Uh, Raf Guerrero moving from left back to central midfield has been absolutely incredible whenever he's played in central midfield and he's been able to put a run of games together. Those are the guys who I really, really admire. Um, and Tony Cross as well. Tony Cross was a number 10 um, in that Bayern Munich team that won the treble back in 12-13. And at Real Madrid, obviously Xavi Alonso had just left and they said, you know what, this guy's going to be our replacement. And it took a while for him to get there and he's never been the defensive powerhouse that Xavi Alonso was. But was clearly the best central midfielder in the world probably mm. two years ago. So, I don't know. that. I mean, that's a pretty impressive transition for that guy. Wayne Rooney is a pretty high-profile example of how this can act to the detriment of a player as well, <laughs> right? So, I mean, slotting back into central midfield for both United in his latter years, Everton, and now being played as more of a forward at DC, <laughs> and finally finishing his career with uh, a goal involvement sort of every game. I think 12 goals... And, seven assists in the MLS uh, in 20 games since he arrived in January at DC. Um, no, it was oh. in the summer, wasn't it? It wasn't, wasn't January. Yeah. Anyway, um, other examples of this. When you, say, when you say classic wingers, yes. I mean, Gareth Bale has moved from left back to essentially a forward. It's pretty impressive, isn't it? Pretty unique in its own right. Ryan Sessegnon kind of emulating that now at Fulham to really good effect. Uh, Jesus Navas, when you say classic out-and-out mm. -out wingers, yeah, I is see that. So, sort of someone that I, I thought would probably have been better off as a right wing-back because he has, he had, I don't know if he still has it, genuine pace. He, he could be a man. He was had decent game intelligence, although his delivery was very inconsistent. I think eight assists in 23-24 starts was his highest return at Manchester City, so not bad by any means, and four assists in 10 uh, La Liga games for Sevilla this campaign and I believe he's club captain so someone that yes maybe if, if he was five six years younger might be able to replicate someone like 
Uh, Marcos Alonso's kind of mm. output, at least going forward, can't see him being very good defensively. But. A potential could be maybe Luke Shaw. What, moving he's further still, up the yeah, field? He's still very young. He can he's also tall enough adapt. to play centre back. He can do anything. He's yeah. six foot tall. <laughs> like, I mean, Lucas Vazquez is actually quite a similar player to, to Jesus Navas, I think, in some senses. Like, really, really fast, uh, does play uninverted. Like, he works very hard defensively. Um, but I guess there are a few players who have been tried out in different positions. So when you've got a really intelligent central defender who's quick, good on the ball, good mm. reader of the game, it's tempting to play them at DM. And as a result, uh, Koscielny uh, played at DM. David Sergio Luis. Ramos. David Luiz. Yeah, Absolutely. David Luiz. Well against Fulham Very as well. good there. And, um, and John Stones looks like he'll be used there intermittently. Mm. I imagine if Gundogan got injured this season, we'd see John Stones in central midfield. Yeah, probably. Zach, anything else to add before we move on to... Thangaland's question that's also about Marcelo, so segues nicely. Welbeck, DM. Oh, God. That man. You know what? Edison up front. Edison was up a front. central midfielder, up wasn't front. he, when he was developing as a Ute? Or yeah. was he a winger? James Wayne, the Man City fan, I looked to him there for a bit of support. Just shake of the head. Check up front. He's played striker, apparently, when he was younger. Yeah, but I mean, he's... he's Six foot four, whack it up. Fit and crouch. Ling worthless. Lingard's pretty much played every position, oh, yeah. barring out and out striker yeah. in a front four or five. But again, those sort of players, Juan Mata as well, uh, very flexible across that forward line. Does it act to their detriment not being... Uh, let's not say a specialist, but not having a defined position because those are the sort of guys that, that come in every third game, aren't they, really? Mm. But it's also, I'd say, it's also a positive because then when you're being looked at, I guess, it, for like, to be signed, they can look at you as he can cover so many positions here and he can, he, we, if we do get an injury, he can cover right wing, he can cover left wing, he can cover centre mid, attacking mid. I think that's probably the best thing. But I, I, I do agree with probably when they're looking at you then, you're never going to be the starter. And your stats can look weird as well. Mm. You know, you can have really, like, your defensive numbers might be pretty good, but not that good because you haven't only played in defence. And your attacking numbers might be pretty yeah, good, but do, not that good because you haven't only more played the team attack. than your own individual calls. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's the kind of thing where they have to watch you. Bit of a thankless task. Um, right, talking off thankless tasks, replacing Marcelo at left back at Real Madrid. So what do you think to this? Barring uh, Hakim coming back from Dortmund, is there any other candidates floating around that big old bond yours? Leon Bailey? Leon Bailey. I think Bailey. Are you ba Bailey's agent? I'm, That's not a terrible I'm, I'm idea. I'm such you know? a fan of Bailey. It's unbelievable. Like, from the, from the videos I've watched, yes, his no. attacking presence. Like he does, I don't even think he plays left back anymore. Really, for mm. Bayer Leverkusen, he's more just a left winger. And I think he barely played left back in in general. But if you're going to attack down the left, he is arguably one of the best young talents you can get to do that. Mm. He's so quick, so skillful, really on the ball, what is the and deal also with him? he's actually a decent dead ball. Chelsea rushed him. Forty million pounds. Him after him. Um, I think one, it's, it's really interesting because of how young he is. Okay. And left back positions, or full back positions in general, are quite hard to come by once you find a, a decent person. Yeah, top, like Aspel like yeah. I mean, Chelsea. Look, look at PSG in, struggles to find yeah. replacements for Mounier and, and Sergio Aurier, who were both deemed not fit for purpose by Tuckle. But. And, and I also think that once you find them there, they usually stay at the club for a very long time. Mm. Ivanovic, Aspel uh, Chelsea so, example. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> young, Neville. <laughs> like if I go on, go on. Uh, but I just think he he really interests me as well. But then I feel I don't know whether if you play him at left back, it's you're not getting everything out of him. Is my only worry. At Real Madrid, you might be just purely because of the way that like you're going to push up the pitch. You're going to mm. be able to have the ball most of the game. The only thing is when he's been really really good at Leverkusen, I feel like it's been as a counter attacker running into space. And he's been a kind of like notional left wing back rather than actually having to defend. Yeah. The trouble is when you're, can can Leon Bailey play left back in a back <laughs> four in an in a big game against a big team in the Champions yeah. League? I don't like, think so. I think Mar that's a bit of a waste Mar of him. Positioning has always, ha uh, there's always been a little left to desire when it's come on uh, to that front. But his actual one on one defending is throughout his career been been pretty decent. I think. Pretty underrated. He's probably a better defender than he gets credit for. Yeah, I think he's. I think he's really. Um, improved. But he can still learn as well, Bailey-wise. He can still learn. Like, he's still incredibly mm. young, and what better place to learn than at Real Madrid? They're going to need to figure out how they're going to do things. At the moment, they have creativity everywhere on the park. Mm. But if their midfield changes, which obviously it's going to to some extent, uh, with Modric, you know, aging out, Kroos is a couple of years away from aging out. Um, they are going to have to decide whether they want their fullbacks to be creative powerhouses in the same way. If they do want that then they'd be, they'd be probably well advised to look at somebody like 
Fozy Gulam or or Raf, back from injury or Raf Thank Guerrero, God. like we were talking about. Raf Guerrero has that. He's he's extremely good on the ball. He's great in transition play. Really good dribble numbers. An extremely good creator. Very good from set pieces as well. Fast. Uh, and I'd say defensively pretty sound and reasonably young. The only issue yeah. is his patchy injury record. But until recently, actually, that was something Marcelo had too. So I don't know. Those are the guys who I think probably profile as being most similar to Marcelo. But whether that's actually the kind of player Real Madrid should be looking at really depends on who is going to be their long-term manager and how that person is going to play. Yeah. I, when you say aging out, by the way, I always think of them disappearing into the ether like on a mm. Marvel film, you know, and just like one Luka of the Modric like, just to dust. <sighs> yeah. oh, I haven't seen it yet. Zidane. That is how Luka Modric will die, though. <laughs> like a little pixie. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yeah. um, moving on from Luka Modric's death. Yeah, they have been pretty reliant on fullbacks in recent systems. Like Zidane, a lot of his success came from Danny Carvajal and Marcelo just kind of joining that attack up. Sure. So. I mean, if Conte is a likely candidate to come in, maybe they can afford some, although he's kind of discounted himself at the minute, hasn't he, from the yeah, race. I don't, I don't think Conte But if, if he was to come in, they could probably afford people who, who weren't as defensively sound, maybe someone a little bit more adventurous, like Leon Bailey, like you're talking about, um, but they'd have to shore up that, that centre-off position because Varane and Ramos haven't been great at the start of the season. I, I maybe adding Nacho to the equation solidifies that, maybe going to a back three like they did in the second half against uh, Barcelona uh, helps. But there is, yeah, there isn't, there isn't a blueprint for this for this side, is there at the moment? No. Uh, Real Madrid, which, I mean, the blueprint before was just uh, literally facilitating Ronaldo's game. Yeah. But um, it'd be interesting to see how they evolve and I think any one of those players would be a good shout. And if you want to hear about our blueprint for Real Madrid's rebuild. Yes! What a plugs, plug. plugs, plugs, plugs. Nice. The best uh, plug. The second episode of the Football Daily podcast, Sunday time, Sunday, what's it Sunday called? Time. Sunday time? Sunday time, Sunday time podcast. Time. Sunday vibe extra time. Extra time where we have rebuilt Real Madrid according to uh, just, you know, Joe's fantasies really. Uh, yeah. But check that out because I do actually think it's quite good. Yeah, shock. Pogba's one of his players. So, anyhow, moving on to personal questions. Oh, Actually, yeah. before we delve into personal questions, what position did you see yourself in growing up? Where did you want to play and where, ultimately, have you found yourself best, best utilised? <laughs> In your, your older age. Weirdly, weirdly enough, I actually always wanted to be a defender. I loved, really? loved tackling. So that's, a goal, that's God. predominantly a goalkeeper. Well, this is it. So Slash I, CB. No, so I had always played in defence up until I was 12, 11. And then I moved yeah. to Algeria for six months. Up until you turned into the f a f yeah. Yeti. No, well, this is it. I moved to Algeria. Oh, no, yeah. The abominable <laughs> snowman. But I moved to Algeria for six months, came back and didn't play football again properly until I was about 15. Jeez. And so during that period is where you learn so much stuff like that. And then I came back and I was tall and they were like, you're going to go? And I was like, yeah, why not? And then basically you went love going and go. I love both. The wingspan I love on the both. guy. I love both. Absolutely, absolutely love both positions. But also, 10 minutes, in, 10 minutes left of the game, sitting up front. Yeah? I'm yeah. such, I'm such a like, threat up front. You're like Stephen Corker. You're like David, yeah. you're like <laughs> David <laughs> James. When Jurgen Klopp was bringing Corker on up front. Was it Corker? Stephen Cork, a bruising defender, talking to bruising defenders at Van Straten. Is that where you imagine yourself just throwing obo elbows at centre back? Obos? Uh, he's a centre mid and he's always been a centre mid. No, I wanted to play. I, I played. I was very slow when I was a kid, but I played on the wing purely because I could uh, deliver a ball. Fair play. That's, that's usually how they I work. got to take set pieces as well. So, what, so Stephen's I mean, dad being manager. That's how it always was. <laughs> Obviously, the place you want to play. Always started. Number and he's 10. Terrible. Yeah, I mean, number 10 is where you want to play. Um, yeah, I don't know You're really. Quite two footed, so I, c I can see that. Um, I'm, 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 I'm definitely, I'm definitely the most two footed. How was a, here. how was a striker who had to nah. realise at 11 years old he could? He's a number I six. I wanted to be a right winger. I wanted to really? be. Oh. Yeah, I was number. I, I'd have had you down that's as when, CM that's when he the, the whole flip line. Line. That's Scott when he Parker. The flip that's all he could learn. Yeah, Scott Parker. Scott Parker is pretty much the, yeah, the, the sort of prototype, the best player I, I, I could be. Sort of, you know, someone with little man syndrome mm. whose short game is fine. Um, no, I was like number seven in my first team growing up and then from a, from a young age re realised I possessed very little pace, moved to <laughs> right back, um, but then had a renaissance Sunday league where I played like CDM and I was CDM for like three or four years and actually enjoyed football much more as a result than oh, playing right back. I absolutely Right back is pretty thankless yeah. when you're just overlapping, overlapping, 100%. overlapping. 100%. Especially when you're not very fast because then you're exposed <laughs> all the time. If you would like to see Chris Hamill playing CDM and me playing centre back. Check out FDFC Dream on team. Saturday uh, on Football Daily, where we played Arsenal fan TV and yeah, well, did all right. 
going live. Be uh, more supportive, please. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Anyway, next question. I don't know if this is personal. We've kind of just gathered them this week. Uh, the quality was, you know, debatable. You're, you're better than that. Um, who is the most underrated team in Europe's top five leagues, according Ooh. to you? So maybe Ooh. a little bit personal. Ooh. Oh, God. Good God. Atalanta. Atalanta are very good. And the Gasparini. Atalanta have been great the last few seasons. They've produced a bunch of talent. They've lost a bunch of talent. Mm. And they're still really exciting. And every season, they have somebody who's worth looking at. So, so they lost... Conti, they lost Kessier. They've still got Papu Gomez, who's mm. still absolutely fantastic. Uh, they had Andrea Patania as well, who's very, very good. And um, actually, the guy who really excites me now is a kid called Musa Barrow, uh, who's a 19-year-old Gambian forward. And last year, he played very limited minutes, but had absolutely insane shot and key pass numbers. Uh, all his shots were inside the box. He was getting about five a game. And so far this season, I don't think he's scored or assisted yet, but he's still getting tons of shots and creating tons of chances and completing a load of dribbles. And when I look at that guy, what it reminds me of is the way Harry Kane's numbers looked when he played like 500 minutes at the end of that Tim Sherwood season. And Tim Sherwood ultimately obviously took credit for like discovering Harry Kane because, you know, he's and, a terrible and narcissist. Bring you back the Gila. Um Yeah, well, he, I mean, that he Did can he bring take it back? For. That's fair enough. Like, but the Harry Kane thing, I'm not sure is him. Uh, and so, yeah, Musa Barrow, I think. The way that Atalanta do it, last season, um, if you go on understat, you can see kind of expected goals, expected points. And last season, they had Atalanta down as the second best team in Syria after Napoli. Class. That's pretty amazing. Nice. They are pretty much the heartbeat, the lifeblood of Italian football at the moment, aren't they? I think their uh, youth setup is comprised of 75% young Italians. And their turnover, like you just pointed towards, is absolutely incredible. Um, a little bit like, kind of like I don't know, producing players in the same way that maybe a Southampton were four or five years ago. Uh, at the moment, uh, I suppose, developing first team players from, from the core of, uh, of their youth teams uh, like Tottenham. So yeah, kind of best of both worlds. Not don't really sell for massive amounts, do they? They probably could, but up the ante in that regard. Well, I think it's partially though because at the moment they're selling mostly inside Syria. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think if the Premier League clubs started paying attention, then you'd see some bigger fees. I mean. But I think as well, teams you have to mention here are the Eredivisie sides. Like the last few seasons, understandably, we haven't really paid much attention to the Eredivisie. This year, Ajax and PSV look great. Both of them look really, really good. Ajax, I think they're on seven points in the Champions League and they could easily make it through, admittedly out of a soft group. But they've already gone away to Bayern and got a very creditable 1-1 draw. If they get a point out of that at home or even win, then they're definitely in the second round. And it would be really exciting to see Ajax in the latter stages of mm. European competition again. Because there's so much talent there. They're so young. They're really organised. And they play really attractive football, what you think of as Ajax football. So I think that those sides, just because we don't see them play big teams, uh, they end up being a little bit underrated because we have no idea how to gauge their quality versus, say, the big sides in the Premier League or something. Yeah, so... Definitely just using the Champions League as a barometer in that sense, and it's looking pretty good. Uh, Dortmund are faring much better than I expected this season. I've not really had a look at their underlying numbers, but I have caught the odd Champions League appearance, and Axel Witzel faring much <laughs> better than we thought he would, returning from China. General <laughs> house are in that midfield, very good uh, organising what is a very young side. Uh, really maximising the sort of young talent in their back line as well. The Yalo, Akanji we like. Um, although Pulisic, his contract is up at the end. Oh, he has one year left? At the end of the season. At yeah, the end of the season. So they're going to need to tie him down uh, pretty quickly. Um, and Jaden Sancho, obviously we've, we've spoke about him as, as a singular topic on Sunday Vibes. So don't need to sort of recover that ground. Um, but at least Dortmund are making uh, the Bundesliga interesting this season. I, I, I don't know if Real Batiste have dropped off. I really enjoyed watching them last season. Is it a Real? If we're thinking about like football teams over the past couple of years. Really around to go down and then come back up and then be challenging in the league of the season. Yeah, like, in general, they've done quite well. Had a very good defence as well. They've always had a good defence. They're very good at finding talent. I mean, like, Rodri was obviously a new example. Previously, centre-backs, you know, produced people like Eric Bailly. So I think, um, yeah, there are those sides, aren't there, who, who normally... Celta Vigo are very good as mm. well. And obviously, Real Betis. Um, <clears throat> all these sides are kind of worth watching. And there's a lot of interesting managerial talent coming through. Mm. So generally speaking, I think... Um, if you, if you watch a, if you watch a game of like mid-table sides around Europe at the moment, chances are you'll see at least 
a couple of interesting yeah. players and maybe an interesting way of playing. Like I said, with Ego, it's really interesting that Emre Moore wasn't getting the minutes. And, and yeah, that got was players weird. like Pioni Sisto, who has become an absolute assist merchant in the in the La Liga. I'll get Chris Fife for that. In La Liga. Uh, anyway, let's move on. Uh, next question comes in from Scott Young. Who is the best pundit on TV for you? We'll do a couple more and we'll mm. wrap it because this week's been a long week. I best think pundit. Al Alex Scott has really taken me by surprise. Yeah, she is. Good. I remember when she was on um, one Love of our live well. streams. Yeah. And like, I remember being there. I was like, she's actually, she's keeping up with Pat here. Like, she's, she's doing all right. Yeah, <laughs> she's, she's doing really well. Um, but also like, she gives like a, one, she's female, which is like, which is really good to see. And she's flying the flag, yeah. To, but she's taken it in her stride so well. Like she, she's talking as if she's been doing it for so many years now. When it's literally been two years max. I feel like she prepares as well. Yeah. Like she goes on with, with like lazy pundits who are used to just getting punditry jobs and do no prep. And they just expect to get paid a fortune to do it. I hate those people. Uh, and she goes on and actually knows her stuff, has actually done her research, pays attention, isn't dogmatic about, you know, the ideas that she came into the game with or that she came into the studio with. Like, those things are so yeah. valuable. I don't know if she has that sense of entitlement either mm. where she, and because of that, articulates her experiences as a player really well yeah. and kind of uses it to help um, explain whatever point she's, she's making and maybe put it in more layman terms for people that aren't necessarily football aficionados, um, which I don't think necessarily, like the, the, big, the big guns do an awful lot. You know, like I don't, I don't I recount a lot of pundits, yeah, kind of boiling down. Uh, their playing career and I mean Rio Ferdinand has been doing it of late and he, he's actually quite good he surprised me he's yeah. pretty articulate he draws on his own experience as well um, so yeah I think there's some good suggestions in there moving swiftly on um, oh that's a bit of a dark question isn't it what this is from Susan Abogu what do you absolutely hate about each other I think she'd what be disappointed note, that Joe's what a note not to on end this one. Oh what a note my god! I, Joe, I'm I'm gonna fly the flag on this one, and I Joe will be keep so this happy. Re relatively short. Chris Hamon, you're chewing gum, my lord. Keep it in your mouth, man. Yeah, I'm a little bit Fergie-esque, aren't I? Just it's just flying it's around. It's like a washing machine. Um, <laughs> Some of the sounds that come out as well are mad. Yeah. I feel like Hamill's. Masticate. I feel like Hamill's not even in the worst three in Football Daily for chewing noises. Oh, okay. Doogie, <laughs> awful. Mike Atkins, a new addition. Michael McCubbin seems to, like, he breathes like a jet engine. Is there, it's unbelievable. Doogie is the only man that chews water. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's incredible the noise that comes out of his mouth. Um, the, the compact amphitheatre formed by his mouth. It's just the neck. The acoustics. On the, <laughs> the gargle on the bloke. But with, 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 uh, that's well trodden ground. We, we, digged, we dug we him dug out. Sun, we times. dug dug out on Sunday vibes, didn't we? Um, about, about, do what I about, do about yourself? What do your, I do? Let's talk about yourself. Like, what quality do you uh, not enjoy about yourself I, I don't like being, in particular? There are times I'll be quite negative about something. Like, You're I not a negative guy. No, there are a few times where I say something that I shouldn't really say. That's such a hilarious problem for you to have yeah, with no. yourself. No, but there's sometimes <laughs> I'm just like, what am I doing, man? Like, that's so nice. You can occasionally sulk, I suppose, like, yeah. or you get down about I'm very things, sore your head loser. drops. You, um, I'm a very sore loser. I think you, you bounce back from the sulk pretty quickly and you acknowledge yeah. that you, you, yeah. you know, you, when you're in the wrong, you admit when you're in the wrong pretty fast. What about you, Pat? Um, to be honest, this doesn't actually come out in the office. I mean, I'm sure people would say it, but it doesn't. <laughs> um, which is, I, I, have a, I have an extremely short temper. Um, I don't tend to let that out as, mu as much in the office, which I think will indicate to all of you how bad it is in my personal life. But, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't know. I think... Um... Christ. I there, mean, were lots of, there were lots of I mean, things, but they're you, not really appropriate to go into on the show. It'd take a while. When you got a splinter on the way in, I could tell that was one, and you, you couldn't get it out, and you were like, "Fucking <laughs> oh, hell!" It was digging into my uh, finger, man. Like that—that that wasn't an anger issue. I just had a splinter in my hand. I didn't enjoy it. Yeah, but you <laughs> like, just, oh, I don't know. I mean, really, I, it's, it's difficult, isn't it? I, I'd say a little bit vain from having a bad air day. It will genuinely annoy me. Um, oh, when you're annoyed as well, it. it, it it ruins your day. I'd say generally, yeah. yeah I'd say generally on FD, when people's heads drop, oh, just... the office just like disintegrates. Mm. Like when people get in it a bad mood, it like office, goes, yeah. it goes on all day. Like because it's quite a young office as well. I think there are a lot of people who can't pick themselves up. Like when they're when they're a bit miserable and it just kind of takes over. Um, fidgeting as well is fucking oh, yeah. annoying. I'm, I'm actually really bad at fidgeting. Oh, you're, well, <laughs> I've know. moved that four different times. McCubbin's the leg. McCubbin's oh, that's like, ridiculous. Sam Obiseki sitting behind the camera, like dropping 
constantly. The most cat handed man in the world. Oh, that, that, that annoys me. People on their phones behind the camera when we're filming. Yeah. Tuesday. Tuesday. No, Tuesday's got an excuse because you doesn't give a <laughs> about what we're talking Tuesday's about. terrible for that. Although it's hilarious that Tuesday now supports Ben Fever. So. <laughs> Very specific. Anyway, that's it for this week's Continental Club. Thank you for your questions. What an episode. I don't know how that's going to turn out. What an episode. Good luck. Turn out the slightest. Three minute edit. Um, yeah, see you next time. And if you enjoyed this, go and watch That Was The League. Go and watch the FDFC Football match Social on, on Football Daily. Football Social on tomorrow, right? Yes. What, is the, what are the games? Are you on it? Arsenal... Arsenal Liverpool. Liverpool. 5.30, me, Jackson, Smithy and guests, TBC. Cool.